I clearly was telling them, I'm about to commit suicide. I'm hearing things, I'm seeing things. Help me, I can't live like this no more. Cindy Arroyo is a nurse in Texas. She also has bipolar disorder. Last March, she found herself in the middle of a psychotic break. But with the virus spreading and the state scrambling to respond, she couldn't get the care she needed. How many phone calls do you think you made? About 30. They kept on adjusting my medication without seeing me. As a nurse, you have to see your patient to know what's going on. And they're like, oh, take your pills and come back next two months. Well, in two months, I'm not going to be here because I'm going to either commit suicide or take all my pills and go to sleep. That's my two options. That's how you were feeling? Yes. Before long, Arroyo was in the ER after a failed suicide attempt. Within weeks after that, she was in jail following a domestic dispute. It took a stay at a local hospital and months of treatment for her to begin to recover. How do you think things would have played out differently if you would have gotten help sooner? I think I wouldn't have any lost time. I felt like I lost a year of my life. In years past, one in five Americans suffered with mental illness. But the anxiety and isolation of living through a pandemic has the CDC worried that that number could now rise as high as one in two. Even as mental illness increases, beds, doctors, and funds previously dedicated to behavioral health have been put towards fighting COVID-19. All right, this is one of our rooms. As you can see, the rooms are pretty sparse for safety reasons, really. People that finally do end up here are in much more of a higher level crisis um, because we are only seeing the most distressed people. And then we know there's a lot of people that just aren't reaching out for help. Dr. Karina Keenman heads up the psychiatric department at Houston Methodist Hospital. This floor used to provide inpatient beds for up to 34 people, but physical distancing cut that capacity in half. Are we in a mental health crisis right now? Oh, no doubt. I think whenever you have something as significant as serious suicidal thoughts doubling within months, and it was already getting to a point where we're really concerned, this is absolutely a, a crisis period of time. If things don't change, can you paint a picture of how bad it can get? I really try not to uh, think about that too often because when you think about how bad things can get or the moments when you know the system's been getting to that point of, of getting overwhelmed, there starts to be widespread suffering and people start to die. You know, my big fear is that if something's not done, there won't be anyone who doesn't know somebody that's ended their life. Across the U.S., even before COVID-19, half of all Americans needing help couldn't get any. But in 2020, access to mental health care in Texas was the worst of all states. Sheriff Dennis Wilson works in the rural county of Limestone where, like many places, law enforcement are the first people called in for a mental health emergency. That's a police broadcast that just went out to all our units here in Limestone County, reference to a suspect that is threatening suicide. How many psychiatrists or social workers do you have in this town? We have zero psychiatrists in this county. And as far as social workers, those are all splattered out across the central Texas area. There's been an uptick in crisis calls something Wilson believes is tied to the pandemic. There's a lot of people that are suffering now because of the economic conditions and because of the everyday strains of life. If you had to estimate, what percentage of calls do you guys get that are mental health related? I would say on an average between 30 and 35 percent. You can trace back to a need or a diagnosis of a person that we're dealing with that has a mental health or a substance abuse issue. That's a high number. It really is. Do you feel like it's your responsibility to make sure that the deputies are trained to respond to mental health crises like that? That is our responsibility of our job and that's part of the oath of office that we take is to protect everyone. I do not control the checkbook nor does any other police administrator that has to come from your government to provide the necessary funds that allows you to have that expertise and training. Hey, 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 hey. 
Are you worried that since there's so few options for treatment in this county that once COVID-19 ends, people will still suffer from those long-term mental effects? Oh, sure. Uh, uh, there's no question about that. There's still going to be a huge need for mental health services. And a person that enters the system in Texas, uh, it takes about eight times longer for them to get through the criminal justice system that there's a person that does not suffer from mental health illness. We have a, a large number of inmates sitting in county jails in Texas, and that number yesterday was 1,264 inmates that have been court ordered by a district judge to receive state services that are on a wait list that sometimes can be as long as a year before they get to that state hospital. And I certainly disagree with that. People do want help. Right. They do. They do want to change their behavior. You be good. You too. And so we offer that uh, to the, them here. These are our veterans. Harris County Jail in downtown Houston is the largest provider of mental health services in the state. How's everybody? Good, good. Who are we? Stores and Stripes. Jennifer Herring is in charge of helping inmates prepare to re-enter society. Her programs provide a full range of support from psychological evaluations to individual and group therapy. We're using this time. Uh, this is a space in our lives that we've been allowed to focus on self, to focus on self. And how do we overcome those barriers? Of the inmates who work with Herring, only 20% re-offend, three times less than the national average for violent offenders. We see PTSD, of course, depression, uh, of course, bipolar disorder. So they could go from anxiety all the way to having a diagnosis of schizophrenia. People who are unstable do things that are unstable. Right. And so that causes them to, in a lot of cases, break the law. We've heard that kind of one of the fastest ways to get mental health treatment is to just wind up in jail. I've heard that too, and that's so sad. These guys most likely wouldn't have come through the system had they had the information to support those needs. Programs like we have here in the jail, out in the community. Before I even was incarcerated, I didn't, I didn't know I had PTSD. I never thought that there was anything wrong. I thought, you know, I just thought differently from most people. One psych pill wasn't working for me, so they were weaning me off of one and starting me on another. And in the weakness of both of them is when I had my relapse. How many of you guys think that if you had access to one of these programs before entering the jail system that it might have prevented you from being here? Wow. Wow. Come on, legislation. Do you think you're going to see an influx of inmates because of the pandemic? When people are scared, they they do things that sometimes are, are antisocial. They'll commit crimes. They'll hurt others. They'll hurt themselves. So I can say that for this entire nation, that we will probably see a rise in the number of mental health cases that we see. We'll probably see a rise in the number of suicides and we'll probably see a rise, unfortunately, in the number of homicides, and it's already starting. What we have right now is a pandemic layered on top of an epidemic. When you think about the state of mental health in America leading into COVID-19, we had rising suicide rates. For the first time in the history of our country, in recent memory, we've had declining life expectancy. And that is largely driven by suicides and overdoses. How have you seen COVID-19 impact people's mental health? Over 40% of Americans have reported that their mental health has worsened um, as a result of COVID-19. There were a lot of people who had never really known what it was like to experience significant distress. And COVID-19 threw us for such a loop that people are experiencing new anxieties, new feelings of, of isolation. There are significant traumas. The economic realities put people in a really bad place. And then there are 20% of American adults who had a mental health issue 
heading into COVID-19. And, and for that group of people, it's exacerbated their symptoms. Can you talk about the differences in these challenges in urban areas versus rural areas? Yeah, we have many people in urban areas, in suburban areas, and rural areas who will say they're not getting the level of access that, that they're looking for. There are more concentrated shortages in, in the rural areas, but just because mental health professionals are in communities doesn't mean that a person is actually able to access them. They may have an insurance company that is unwilling to provide adequate reimbursement for mental health services. And the, those types of denials by insurance companies are a primary reason why access to mental health care is so limited. Is it all coming down to money at this point? I think hospitals are in a tough spot, and we, of course we have a for-profit healthcare system. The safety nets that we do have in place for people who are uninsured um, aren't adequate. People need ongoing services and supports, and a continuum of care when they leave the hospital to facilitate their re-entry into the community. Hospitals are often discharging much sooner than they know is best for a person because of money. It's a failure of our overall system and, the, and our state. In certain ways, the mental health treatments have come a long way. We now have much more evidence-based treatment than we've ever had. We know what works to help a person with a mental health condition. But as a, as a society and as a state, we don't do enough to actually link that person up with the things that work. And as a result, they cycle through the revolving door of the criminal justice system, of emergency rooms, of homelessness, right back into the community. And they don't get what they need in the community, so they, they end up cycling through once again. So who can we talk to about this? I would say first and foremost, it's, it's the elected officials who have the ability to write budgets. They have the ability to ensure that insurance companies are held accountable. Uh, they have the ability to prioritize housing. We also need to be holding local decision makers accountable as well. County commissioners, mayors, county judges who are the, the chief executives for the county. They can make a huge difference. They can establish local initiatives, invest more local money in, in these kinds of services.